Welcome back to the Quantum Guides show. I am very pleased to introduce you to today's guest is Augie Nost. He's a friend, author, radio host, and spiritual teacher. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, let me tell you a little bit about this amazing man. Augie was born on a farm in Norway, and after he graduated from agricultural college, he continued to work on the family farm for several years. Yet while he was still a teenager, he learned hypnosis from a magician in Europe. Later, he spent one year in mandatory military service driving a battle tank. And by the age of 25, he had learned several languages, studied science, including metaphysics and different forms and theories of spirituality. At the age of 25, he left Norway. He moved to the USA and he attended flight school at the Emory School of Aviation in Greeley, Colorado. And later in 1975, he and a partner started one of the most active flight schools called Arrowhead Airways Incorporated out of Minneapolis, Minnesota. Eggy flew piston, turbo propeller, jet aircraft, and he logged in more than 10,000 hours of flight time, including almost 1,000 hours of upside down aerobatic, uh, teaching aerobatics. After he sold his share of Arrowhead, um, Airways International, sorry, Incorporated with his partner. He started American Barter Incorporated, also in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Now, between then and now, Augie has been involved in so many projects. Let me just tell you about a few. Um, Augie got more interested and studied in paranormal research, hypnosis, oil painting, teaching hypnosis, and mind development. He taught the Subliminal Dynamics Mind Development course, now called Zox Pro Training, which teaches you to assimilate information from a book at a rate of 50,000 words per minute, gain perfect memory, improve creative visualization for healing and manifestation, creative goal setting and other things not taught in the regular school systems. Augie created and operated the Freedom Civil Rights Investigation Service and he created, wrote, and published The Constitutional Liberator, which was a monthly newsletter covering controversial political issues, kind of the truth behind the truth, health issues and banned medical cures that really work, and other topics the mainstream media don't dare to touch. He co-authored a book with Patricia Ress of Omaha, Nebraska, titled Alien Encounters in America's Midwest. It features hidden government documents, proving the government cover-up of the UFO issue, NASA prints of buildings and structures on our moon, and personal testimonies from actual UFO abductees. In 1999, Augie hosted a live call-in show, radio show, on KTKT Radio in Tucson, Arizona, and it dealt with the holistic health care, oxygen in the body, nutrition, and how to stay healthy in a natural way. Then for six years, he was the host and producer of a live TV talk show called The Hidden Truths in Tucson, Arizona. It featured the paranormal, UFOs, controversial political issues, government cover-ups, mind development, hidden and banned medical cures, future science and other outside-of-the-box issues not covered by the mainstream media. For five years, Augie was the host of a TV newscast called Access News. It featured mostly the politically incorrect news behind the news. And in 2000, he helped create, operate, and manage a radio station, KRVL, in Tucson, Arizona. It was mainly talk radio to educate the people on constitutional and freedom-related subjects, as well as the paranormal and spiritual issues. Because of its uniqueness, a film documentary called Making Waves was created about the radio station and the people running it. This TV documentary was presented at the International Film Festival. Then on February 28th, the year 2000, a star was named after Augie and was registered with the International Star Registry in Switzerland. The star number is 3101159 and it's located in the Pisces constellation. In 2003, he was interviewed by BBC Television in England for a TV documentary titled Time Trip, discussing the possibilities of and practical applications of time travel. Other interview, others interviewed for the same documentary include the foremost experts on theoretical physics, 
who presented the technical side of time travel. The TV documentary has been shown globally to about a billion people. Augie wrote the book Universe, Universal Success Principles and How Billionaires Think, and the link to that is in the description box below. He put out a video documentary under the brand name Fast Walkers Open Files, Volume 6, featuring UFO, Alien Presence, Universal Consciousness, the real power of the mind, and other things that we're not supposed to know about. And with a co-host in Germany, Augie is doing a radio show called The Universal Consciousness Show, which is live at 11 o'clock in the morning on Mondays, U.S. Pacific Time, or 1900 Greenwich Time. And it's available at www.kcoreradio.com. Again, all the links will be in the description box below. Finally, <clears throat> or more up to date, I should say, with two partners, Augie started a podcast with video production called Broadcast Team Alpha. And it can be found at www.broadcastteamalpha.com. Be sure to check out Augie's website with the archive of radio shows, news, blogs, and over 5,000 plus unbelievable pictures found at www.universal-consciousness-show.com. Augie is easy to find all over the internet, YouTube, Facebook, just Google Augie Nost. And last but not least is Augie's latest book called Spiritual Science, Higher Consciousness Thinking, and how to access the universal consciousness now available at www.amazon.com and today we get to talk about this wonderful book welcome and thank you so much for coming on the quantum guide show augie i love this book so much if you can believe it i'm almost halfway through reading it for the second time it is so full of valuable information i can't recommend it enough wow <laughs> how, can I, how can I top that? I mean, with all that stuff said, uh, gosh, it makes me feel almost sound like I should have been around a couple of hundred years. That makes me feel <laughs> old or something. <laughs> I think you're a really good example of how when we open up our minds to opportunities, we can have a wonderful life full of adventure. Yes. And you have certainly, certainly had that. So can you tell us, Augie, a little bit about how you came about writing this wonderful book? Yeah, I, uh, I can do that, actually. Um, well, you said you're halfway through it the second time, and I recommend that you read it three times, because the book is written on three levels of consciousness, and uh, you're going to learn more because more will reveal itself every time you go through it. So when you're done with the third time, uh, make sure we get in touch because that at that time you should be ready for stage two. Oh, stage two. Well, well I'm yeah. sure going to look forward to that because yeah. every every chapter in the book is relatively short and easy to read, but I found that it really got me thinking. It got me thinking about what is life, what is this world. Uh, for so long, I knew that so much of what we experience is not even real. Yep. And um, I was just so thrilled to be able to really get into the stuff that's in this book and really think about it. Think about how it applies to my life. What's going on around us and what our possibilities are, Augie. That's the really exciting part. Everything is possible. And uh... You asked how the book came about. Well, it's kind of a, it's a combination of a universal download that I had, as well as my own research that is put into it to kind of supplement and also confirm that my download was real. Absolutely. And uh, what I would, uh, to explain this download a little bit, that was, um, I've been meditating uh, most of the time, there were a time after I came to the U.S. that I didn't meditate much for about five years, but I was too busy flying through the sky. But um, after that, I started meditating again. And um, when you do that, your mind open up to other realities. And uh, there were um, <clears throat> one time where I was put in a situation where I had the time in the morning to sit and meditate for 20 minutes or more. And 
I was in meditation and I could see the flashes of light coming in from the periphery of my eye or my field of vision behind closed eyelids. And uh, it got brighter and brighter until it was just all just totally white. And then in that white, I could see things starting to emerge that could be like images, could be thoughts, and that could be um, inventions, that could be future flashes of future event or past. Basically, what happened in about, well, it was less than 10 seconds, probably more like five seconds, it all flashed by. And the, the whole universe in concept and detail was pretty much explained. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, when I when I when that was done, I was just sitting there. Wow, what in the world am I going to do with this one? <laughs> I couldn't tell anybody about this because they think I was probably even more nuts than I was. And uh, I didn't uh, say much about it. I grabbed a, a tablet and a pencil and I wrote pretty much for three days on notes that I of things that I've seen. And then um, after that, I just kept reading my notes and remembering what I had seen because uh, the memory of it was very clear and I could call it up pretty much at any time. Mm -hmm. And I, uh, I talked to another guy that was there and uh, a level-headed, well-educated man. And he says, oh, yeah, he says, uh, that, that makes sense to me. He says, uh, go get a hold of this book about quantum mechanics and read it. So I did. And uh, right there, much of what I saw was in that book. Mm -hmm. And when we talk about a universal download like this, that is nothing special to me because a lot of people have this. And uh, <coughs> even Nikola Tesla talked about the fact that he... Uh, he electrocuted himself one time. He was sitting there in, uh, and he had a Tesla coil running and he evidently touched the wrong wire or something going into it and he got knocked right on his butt. And he says, for a short moment, I saw the past, present and the future. Mm -hmm. And uh, he talked about that a little more afterwards. And also there are other people, there are artists, there are politicians, there are... Um, uh, other people, even Joe Dispenza talks about having a universal download with much of the stuff that he writes about was given to him. So this is not special to me, but it does happen to a lot of people that do meditate and to reach into that universal mind and try to pull things back to you. And it comes back. Once you reach for it, it comes back. And... Uh, these kinds of things, I would really encourage people to start meditating or start reaching into that universal mind and ask questions because things come back. Not necessarily when you want it to come back. It can come back in the shower. It can come back while you, let's say, in, in the morning when you wake up. Before you, even more than one eye is open, you can just have this flash, you know, and then what happens in the morning is a lot of times when you go to sleep, you can ask yourself questions right about the time you fall asleep. It says, I need the answer for and then name it. Mm -hmm. And the subconscious mind will reach into the superconscious mind. And the superconscious mind is basically a, it's a connecting device into the universal mind. So uh, it can start pulling back and you can get the answer. You might get it in a dream, which you think might be a dream, but maybe it's not. Or you can get right after you wake up or you can go three days and you suddenly have it. So start exercising that mind and in that book i talk about how to do that and uh, there are some simple methods to do this and when we talk about our existence here i uh, I'm, I'm, i know i'm kind of hogging the microphone here but I'm gonna okay. do it for, uh, for um 
this will act, actually I'm going to take about a minute and a half to explain this because this explains what we are. And um, for the last 300 years or so, we've been told that matter and energy cannot be created from nothing. And that's, you know, that was Newton's theory. And then again, we have this challenge to that concept, and that is that some of the most brilliant people on the planet, they're saying that their equations on the blackboard using quantum mechanical uh, uh, theories or quantum mechanics that show us that this universe is created from nothing. So if this universe was created from nothing, everything in this universe is created from nothing, and you are in this universe created from nothing. Okay, Karen. What Buckles the mind. <laughs> ah, then I must be nothing. Yeah, you actually are, but we see stuff. What's this stuff around us? When you were peeling potatoes the other day and you cut your finger, that hurt, didn't it? That really felt real. It felt real. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what is it? Let me explain another one that will take about 28 seconds. Okay. I'm a hypnotist. If I put you in a soft chair and talk to you for about 15 minutes or so, and I tell you that when you wake up, you will see an elephant standing next to you in the room. I snap my finger and bring you back out. And you look over there. If I did my job right, you will see an elephant standing over there. And you can hear him breathing. You can smell him. And you can reach out and touch the snout on that elephant. And you can feel the rough texture of the skin. Now, I'm looking over there. I don't see a thing because there is no elephant. But you can see him. So now my question is, what happened to your real world? Well, like explained in your book, Augie, I think we are in a mind projected holographic universe because I myself have done my own experiments and I have had some astounding results. I have changed somehow the field without even expecting to change the field to even go back and change history, my own personal history, mm -hmm. and not expecting anything to change, and yet the changes all manifested oh. like dominoes from that point that I that I made the changes. So I'm with you 100%. Yeah. Yeah, and this is what is really hard to wrap our heads around. That nothing, this desk, it's a desk made from metal, but it is really not real. It is a mind-projected image mm -hmm. that gives the sensations and the experience of solidity and reality, all created in the mind. Now, and this is hard to wrap our heads around, but that now also show that the, um, there is scientific experiments under quantum mechanics that prove this is the way it is. Would you be referring to the experiments where the fact that there was an observer actually changed the outcome? Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. He can uh, actually change the outcome of the past. There are scientific experiments that show that we, first of all, we can react to an event that not, has not happened yet. Or we can actually change an event in the past. Now that opens up another can of worm. Have, have you ever stirred something up so bad that you want to go back and have a do-over? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you, though, we laugh at this, but it really is possible. So then the next question, of course, is how in the world can we go back and change something that has happened? Now we're stepping into time travel.
Absolutely. That is one of the things in the book I show you in actually in the back of the book, one of the last chapters, I show people how they can do this mm -hmm. and it can work. Mm -hmm. Now, if you were to change the past, there are actually you're not changing your present past. You are creating a new past. Mm -hmm. Because the present, remember, matter and energy cannot be changed. But it can be altered before its source. So creating a new timeline going in a different direction. Let's say that um, 10 years ago, New Year's Eve, you did something really stupid, Carol. <laughs> I'm Karen. Um, okay, so you want to go back and change that. Go back to several days before to an event where you know that you can identify the event mm -hmm. yourself in the event it kind of anchors you into that it anchors you into that mm -hmm. slot in history mm -hmm. so now you go ahead and you know that on that new year's eve you're going to do something stupid so you say okay i knew i did that in this timeline mm -hmm. but i will consciously make a different decision when that time comes mm -hmm. so you will change a new timeline that will go in a different direction because that stupid thing will never happen in your mind and if you go back and visit that event making that different decision over again over again over again over again there could be a very well be a time when your consciousness make a shift and follow that new timeline and you now have changed the past but not in the present timeline you were, that will still continue, but mm -hmm. your consciousness will be embedded in that new timeline. So that is all you have memories of and you will have no knowledge of the timeline that you did that stupid thing. I would agree with you. Um, can I tell you about something that I do, which actually is also in the book? Uh. And another way that I have changed um, the timeline or my history is through forgiveness. And you talk about forgiveness in your book. So I go back to an event that I perceive as being real in my life. And I, I perceive of the event as being a certain way. Well, as soon as I uh, go to universal consciousness and absolutely, seriously, sincerely desire to just forgive this person, turn them over to universal consciousness, um, and to then heal from that event. And what happens is, very fast, there, there doesn't seem to be any time or distance in other realms that we can operate in, um, the ramifications then change and the discomfort that I may be experiencing in the now now is gone. So yeah. I'm wondering what you think about that. Well, it's very possible. It may take, I mean, if you start on this today, chances are it's not going to happen tomorrow at four o'clock in the afternoon. It may take a little while because you may have to pave that road in the new time yes. so that it becomes more embedded in your subconscious, which is one of the blocks for information coming from the universal mind. Right. So, so once we forgive and then we see the whole um, over time, in a very short time, I start to see the situation is different. I moved with compassion. And then my, me, the observer of my own life, now has a different track, and it seems to hold true for me. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I it's, encourage people to do this. Just start doing it. Of course, you know, it's explained in a lot more detail in the book, so that will be easier to understand. Another thing is that when we talk about time, uh -huh. there's a concept in the book that I think will be very good to talk about, and that is that... Uh, Time seems to put its stamp on us, called aging. And uh, if we live in a mind-created universe, 
could it be that our mind can affect the projection or the chronological project uh, pro progression of time too? Oh yes, it can. Uh -huh. um, let me give you an example. In the book, I talk very. Uh, there's a good subject uh, in there and some uh, examples and uh, show you how to do this, how to re actually reverse the aging process. Now. I'm doing this, and it seems to work for me. I can see some stuff that uh, I mean, five years ago or four years ago, I was starting to look a little rough in the, around the ages. So mm -hmm. I don't feel like I do that anymore, and I have more energy than anybody I know. I'm 73, and I work 12, 16 hours a day, and uh, I'm fine. It works excellent. Now, did you know that in 2009 there were three doctors that got the Nobel Prize for discovering an enzyme that reverses the aging process? I didn't know that. Yeah, okay. So, nobody told you. I wonder why. <laughs> reversing the aging, there you go, reversing the aging process of people that could create some challenges to society. Can you imagine what would happen to pension programs and Social Security and, uh, of course, here in Canada, whatever they have out there? They were bankrupted. Mm -hmm. Or maybe not. They might find different ways. But it will upset the status quo. And mm -hmm. we can really do this. Because there, this enzyme that they discovered is called telomerase. And as we progress in our aging, the body creates less and less of it until there's next to very little. Mm -hmm. Think about it. science know why we are physiologically aging. And that is because at the end of the chromosome, there is a little, a little kind of like the end of a shoelace, a little bit right there. Every mm -hmm. time a cell multiply itself, or divide, that little thing that's called the telomeres. They get shorter and shorter and shorter and shorter for every time. So if the cell has divided, let's say, 30 times or five times, depends on which cell it is, then this telomeres get so short it is no longer able to keep the end of the chromosome which holds our genetic code together. Mm -hmm. and the ends start fraying, and the cell is no longer able to replicate itself. Mm -hmm. now you're stuck with old cells in the body, and the more old cells, the more wrinkles we get, and there we start aging, and eventually that's supposed to be fatal to you, so you die. Now, if we can have enough of that enzyme mm -hmm. that prevents the telomeres from shortening, the cells are able to replicate themselves, and you don't age. Mm -hmm. There is ways to do this. There is a um, the pharmaceutical industry got involved, and they created a product called TA-65. And uh, I'm hearing that uh, it works somewhat, but there are side effects. And then the other people say it didn't do a thing for me, so uh, we don't really know about that. Mm -hmm. But uh, I'm doing it the cheap way. I'm using uh, the same method as some of the people that has become very old that I found. Mm -hmm. And I'm kind of going with them. Mm -hmm. I, I ran into the stories of a guy in China. He was a, um, he was a martial art instructor for the army, the Chinese army. Uh, for as long as anybody had known. And uh, he died from an accident at the age of 256. Now, that sounds ridiculous, but then again, I, the more I started writing, I found other people. Mm -hmm. found people in the Middle East, uh, there's a woman in uh, Nigeria, she's 70 something, and then um, there was. Uh, there was a Chinese university professor that came to New York and he died from food poisoning at 154. Mm -hmm. So these things happen. 
and they had one thing in common, which is illustrated by what uh, the the uh, the Chinese ambassador told the uh, the uh, the guy at the morgue in New York in the mid 1950s when this happened. They asked him, "How could this guy be 154 years old?" So the ambassador <laughs> told him. Well, first of all, he only ate Chinese herbs and berries. Mm -hmm. And he also knew he could never die. <laughs> and I think that is the important part. Mm -hmm. Knowing, because we live in a mind-created universe. If you know you could never die, chances are that uh, the only way you could die was to step in front of a bus or get food poisoning. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Actually, I have heard, I, I've been doing research too for a number of years, and I have heard other people report um, of um, them, you know, taking a, a hike up in the Himalayas up to a monastery and then finding out that the, the woman that hiked up there with them, and this is not a small thing to hike up these mountains, was 150 years old. And this is not, uh, we think in our um society that this is some rare rare occurrence not at all this this happens all kinds of places has been happening all through time and it is primarily based well i would say partly based on their belief which is probably the strongest element but also what they eat what they consume and i also am a believer that there is a plant for every problem on yeah. this planet but that's a little off topic um, yes, I think we can live a lot longer than we ever dreamed possible. Um, and I'm just really excited about your book. I want everybody, if possible, to have a copy because it will open up their minds to what's possible. And I don't expect people to run off and just do everything we do, just like us. No, no, they can find their own ways. Everyone has their own approach and their own ways of creating their world, creating their life, and how different this world could be when we just take the focus off money, 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 money. I'm not saying money's evil, but I'm saying because of the love of money and the obsession with power, you know, we have all kinds of systems that aren't serving us, medical systems that aren't serving us, political systems, I won't go on and on. Um, but very, this is such important information. Yeah. And it's a bit like what you say in the book, you know, the universal consciousness or God, it'll give you the nut, but it won't crack it. We got to go digging, we got to we got to learn, we got to find our own way. And I also think that you and I are not that unique. Well, we are unique, but we're not. Uh, other people can have what we have. They can oh, yeah. know what we know. And so your book is just such a wonderful uh, educational tool, Augie. Yeah, and it was fun writing it. Actually, it was fun. I, I got into that, and uh, there were times when, uh, when I was actually putting it together in book form. I, I sat there and wrote and wrote and wrote, and I looked at the clock and said, wait a minute. It's yeah. almost 24 hours since I started. I better sleep a little bit. <laughs> you know, you just get involved in it. And when you are in that zone, mm -hmm. time doesn't really affect you that much. Mm -hmm. And, um, yeah, there is a lot of subjects in the book. And um, uh, one thing, too, that I wanted to mention is uh, manifestations. There are many words for it. The law of attraction is another one. Prayer is another one. Prayer is just a request for manifestation. Uh -huh. But most prayers go unanswered. And we wonder why. Well, first of all, we're not using the right language. Uh -huh. And in the book, I go about, first of all, I go about explaining exactly what I do in order to reverse the aging process. You can look at that sometime on when there is time for people. But prayers, there is a universal language, and it's not one of words. It's not German, Swedish, Chinese, Bulgarian, or English, or anything like that. It is a language of emotion, mm -hmm. colorful pictures, gratitude, forgiveness, love. These kinds of things is the universal language. 
-hmm. And the spiritual entities don't necessarily have names. When they want to communicate from one to another, they visualize the image of the other entity they want to communicate with, and that is the, the, the telephone call to bring them and also to recognize them. That is their name, the way they look. And they could look whichever way that they would, uh, that they could uh, want to project themselves. Mm -hmm. And uh, when it comes to prayer, a group is better than one. Mm -hmm. You engage the mastermind principle. Mm -hmm. But two or more are united in harmony. They create uh, two or more minds are united in harmony. They create a third mind that has the potential mind power of the two or more of them multiplied by each other. So are you saying that the whole, the power and the effect is more than the adding up of the, uh, are, is more than, than, than the actual people are putting in? Basically, we exponentially make the prayer stronger. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. yeah. You, when you join minds, you create a bigger bubble. Mm-hmm. Or a bigger mind so that's why uh, group prayers are uh, it always seems to work a little better mm -hmm. though and also that ties into the size and the power of the individual mind mm -hmm. if you have one that is good at this good at manifestations and understand the universal consciousness and uh, have a big aura yeah those can get better results than others also mm -hmm. And uh, that is also well explained in the book. Mm -hmm. And it's... in there also, I talk about a method where we can actually design the future before we have to live it. And think about it. People spend more time planning their vacation than they <laughs> do planning their life. Yeah. Yeah, when the kids go to college and they ask, you know, first year or two, when you ask them, what are you going to major in? Oh, gosh, I don't know. <laughs> That's not a plan. Mm -hmm. You should have had all that planned out by the time you get there. Now, your plans may change once you're in it, but mm -hmm. make another plan. Mm -hmm. Have one. So when it comes to creating the future there is something that deals with manifestation and that is first know what you want mm -hmm. and then know what you're willing to do in order to get what you want mm -hmm. thereon visualize it in your mind so you have a good concept of what it looks like what it feels like what it will do for you and everybody else around you and when you have a good picture of it like that, place that picture in the future at a time-coded event. Don't say uh, 3rd of July in uh, 2029. That is worthless to the universe. It doesn't understand calendars. But mm -hmm. it understands a Christmas party where you can visualize people around you or mm -hmm. your birthday party. They mm -hmm. understand things like that better. Mm -hmm. So place that thing in the future and then go back and forth and visit it. Get into that mindset of being in it and already having it mm -hmm. and walk around in it. See other people enjoying it with you, doing it, whatever you create in the future. So go back and forth, visit it every day. Let's say that there's something you really want and you want to have, let's say, by next New Year's party. Mm -hmm. uh, not the one where you did the stupid thing, Karen. <laughs> <laughs> Different New Year's party. Another one. A do-over. <laughs> yeah. And uh, then do that all of next year. Every day go back up there and visualize it. Back and forth. Whenever you go back and forth like that, you lay down attractor strings. These are tiny strings of light. That is not photonic light. This is a spiritual form of light. 
that you lay down and the more you do it, the stronger that thread will become and it pulls you up that timeline towards that thing you created in the future. Mm -hmm. And when you do this, as time progresses, you're going to see that things kind of come in from the sides and join you in it. People will come out of the woodwork from unexpected sources to help you. And uh, good, like I say in the book too, it's just good things will fall out of trees on your path. So mm -hmm. it just happens. The more you work on it, the more you do it, the more sure you will be to be pulled up that timeline and undesirable things will stay away because you have your eye on the goal. Mm -hmm. This is, it works. I've done it and it works. Mm -hmm. And um, another thing is where, uh, you know, this is a form of law of attraction. Mm -hmm. And uh, my co-host on one of the radio shows, Nori Love, is very good at this. She teaches law of attraction. And I learned a lot from her, too, to add to what I have talked about and written about. Mm -hmm. So this is something that is better explained in the book also. But I think people should start planning the future and don't just go with, oh, whatever happens will happen. Mm -hmm. I hear you, it will happen. Mm -hmm. Not necessarily um, what you want. Yes, I found for myself uh, an obstacle that I had in the past. Uh, not, we won't get into the past being the past, but um, is I used to feel that I used to think that I had to do it all on my own, and it was overwhelming and it was scary, but in practical application of actually working with the principles that are in your book and um, I have found that it's the universal consciousness is full of mercy and loving kindness when I really really want something and it's to my highest good um, the universe will move mountains for me but I have to take the steps I have to recognize opportunities as they come into my field go aha that's an opportunity to get you know make make my goal come true and then I need to keep keep pursuing it so it's not like like I'm lying in bed all day dreaming of um, this outcome that I want. Yes, I do spend time in meditation. I spend a lot of time every day in prayer because I just love the connection with higher consciousness. It's just such a beautiful, replenishing, healing place for me to spend some time every day. Plus, it resets me on what is real according to my terms. Yeah. But as I go out, I, I do, I do what I can. I contact people that I just get, I mean, even you and I, how did I, how did I find you? I just saw you on another show. I wanted to contact you and, and tell you how much your work meant to me. One thing led to another. We became friends. This is how the universe works. We had, I had no idea that you were going to fall out of a tree into my path and many other things that happen. And so it's so wonderful for me to know that I only have to do my best today. I don't have to worry about tomorrow. I don't have to worry about what I did wrong yesterday. But today I'm doing my best and I'm doing that bit towards making it happen. And then the universe just opens up these amazing opportunities for us. That is also outlined in the book. And uh, I just wanted to say something about that. Yeah. So I'm wondering, Augie, something that uh, the book is so full of information and uh, you have such a lovely way of presenting the information so that it doesn't make me feel stupid or it doesn't feel, make me feel inadequate. I feel very, I found your book to be what I would call very soul affirming. You are able to somehow meet us through your words on a very everyday a uh, practical level where I can understand and assimilate it. Uh, so many books, you pick them up, and boy, I just, I have a difficult time reading in the first place, but then if I can't generate the mental imagery of what's being communicated, I don't get a lot out of it. Your book is so great at not only making it easy for me to understand and meet you where you're at, but you also present some other really interesting 
information. And I'm, I'm wondering if we could just talk a little bit about that. You, you talk about what Jesus looks like. Most people think, well, you know, he's this blonde, blue-eyed guy like uh, from uh, from um, the Vikings. Uh, other people believe he was um, much like people from Africa. People believe all, all kinds of things. And of course, the image of of Jesus has been constructed also as a part of mainstream religion. But I'm wondering what you have to say about what Jesus actually looked like. Would you like to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, uh, we could. Um, uh, first of all, there is uh, people that has written books about the fact that he never existed. Mm -hmm. There is uh, several books that I run on to say, so well, there's, if he was such a big thing during that period of time, how come history don't write about him? Mm -hmm. so, <clears throat> the thing about it is that history actually does write about. There is enough bits that has slipped through the cracks of the Catholic Church and become available. Mm -hmm. Because most of what uh, written about him that is hidden in the archives of the Vatican, and they don't let you see it. Mm -hmm. There is some things that is out there, and um, uh, one of them is his wanted poster that the Romans <laughs> put out. Yeah, I read about that. But it was running around Judea, which is kind of like a farming community. There was there's no no town there. But uh, he was running around talking uh, really nasty stuff about the, German, uh, the, the Romans and trying to whip up a sentiment of going to arms and drive the, the Romans out. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the Romans, they didn't like that much. So they uh, put out a wanted poster for him. They wanted him arrested and tried for political agitation. Mm -hmm. That was the charge. And... On that wanted poster, they list he is going by three names. They also explain what he looked like. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, there is uh, one of them uh, that his real name was Joshua Beth Halachme. Halachme was Joseph's last name. And uh, Joshua, that was uh, what he was called. There's some people that say, oh, there were other names that he used. Uh, well, yeah, well, okay. But uh, there's two more that uh, I talk about in the book also. Now, the way that he is explained on the wanted poster was information given to the Romans by one of his contemporaries. Mm -hmm. And I have my own theory about the information that was given to the Roman. And I believe that they were given the Romans the wrong information mm -hmm. because they wanted to protect him. Mm -hmm. Because they say that he was uh, converted to our measure, that he was probably about a little over a meter tall. That's about three, four foot tall, <laughs> and, he was old, and he was hunched over when he walked. That's the information that show up on the Roman wanted poster. And uh, I don't buy that for a second, but it's there. Mm -hmm. so there is another record of what he looked like that comes out of an appendix to the Dead Sea Scrolls. Hmm. And that is actually something that slipped through the cracks of the Jews in the uh, 1950s when they started to convert the uh, the Rome, uh, the, um, con the uh, translate the uh, Dead Sea Scroll, the Qumran scrolls. And uh, you probably may not know that about close to half of the Dead Sea Scrolls are classified top secret by the Jewish government. Nobody can read it. Mm, I didn't that, know that. Yeah, why would that be? There's stuff they don't want us to know. And uh, one of those things is, is an old document that I got a hold of while I was still back in Europe, probably close to 50 years ago now. That slipped through the cracks of the uh, Jewish translators. And it explains a different looking person of the Meshichia, and uh, he is then 
the Messiah that is translated into uh, Messiah. Mm -hmm. And they claim that, and of course, uh, Joshua Beth Halachman never claimed to be the Messiah. He, he says, no, 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 uh, no, I want no part of that. That's not me. That's too much of a responsibility. In fact, he was a, a freedom fighter. Mm -hmm. but the explanation that shows up in that uh, that little uh, appendix to the Dead Sea Scrolls show him a totally different tall person, and they didn't use colors so much, and uh, I explain this a little better in the book. But they talk about his hair being as the the um, the the ripe field of grain and his eyes as the midday sky. Hmm. And he was tall. Mm -hmm. Doesn't sound like he was a, a Jew. Uh, imagine there are Jews that could have bluish eyes and when you talk about the the ripe field of grain, that kind of like is blondish, uh, yellowish. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm going to really go out on a limb here. I didn't mention that in the book, but I thought of it afterwards. And that is the fact I also ran across an old uh, document showing that they're stating that there were no record of this, what later became Jesus before he had, had the age of about five years old. Mm -hmm. Record of him. Nobody mm -hmm. knew of him. Mm -hmm. And that could, I mean, there's one guy out there, I'm not going to mention his name, but he wrote and says, I can prove that, that uh, Jesus was a drop-off by an alien race here on Earth. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm not totally excluding that either, because I just have a friend in Phoenix that also remember being dropped off. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. seven foot tall, and he uh, has got those same characters, char characteristics. Mm -hmm. I wanted to ask you, Augie, do you think that, um, you sort of allude to it in your book, but do you think maybe there was three or four or maybe even more people who, um, lived around that time, some were more political, some maybe were more spiritual, and the church in 500, about 500 years later, uh, has constructed the, the common Bible, has constructed what uh, the Christ and what that was all about, and it's sort of our job to then pick through that and come to our own through meditation and um, approaching universal consciousness, come to our own decisions on on what was or what wasn't. I think part of the problem too is the church says everyone's scared to death of going to hell if they don't believe everything that they're told. Yeah. You know, be afraid of the church. Be afraid of the tax man. Be afraid, afraid of the doctor. I mean, it's just no end to it. Anyway, yeah. my question to you was: is that is that it could be a composite? of maybe even four or five different people that lived at that time. It's a composition of a lot more than that. There <laughs> is, I have found 16 different religions which have a savior that was born from a virgin, taught in the, the temple or the uh, wherever they were, yeah. teaching spirituality at the you know age of 12, and he died at the age of 33, and all these commonalities in the Christian faith mm. exist in 16 other religions. And prior, way prior, like way thousands prior. of years prior to the so-called so Christian yes, era. In some cases. And uh, see, the, the way the Bible came about is that um, the emperor at the time uh, when the first draft was written, uh, Constantine, he looked at the Jews and he saw that they are working together. They never fight among themselves. They support each other. There is no <laughs> conflict whatsoever. And I want that for my empire. So he told 223 people, go to Nicaea and create a religion that will unify my empire and do not emerge before you have done so. It's exactly what he told them. Mm -hmm. and they did. They went through 9,000 scrolls and tablets and old writings from thousands of years earlier. They mm -hmm. 
picked and chose out of those scrolls. They rewrote the scrolls with what they wanted to control the people, and then they burned the original one, and the rewrite became the original. Mm -hmm. So what happened there is that they took information from thousands of years earlier, extracted it, and created the Bible, and credited it to their God that they created right there, and mm -hmm. this fictitious, at the time, personality called Jesus, which of course wasn't his name because the letter J wasn't invented before in around 1400. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So what they, what they did is that they manufactured probably the biggest part of it. Now that doesn't mean that it's bad because they also took the love and they took the gratitude and they took be good to your neighbor and they took all this from previous writing and stuck it in the Bible. Mm -hmm. It is there. And that's why I, I tell people, Bible is one book that you should read at least once. And that's all you need. Mm -hmm. Then you got enough of the truth and you got enough of the lies. Now, from now on, it's up to you to figure out mm -hmm. who you want to live with. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's wonderful. Wonderful. And um, Augie, we're getting uh, close to the end of our uh, time together. Um, I'm hoping you want to come back and talk some more and we could get into, we didn't really touch much. Well, we did, but we didn't on the quantum mechanics. And yeah. uh, there's just so much more that we could tell people. But before we end, um, even though I mentioned it at the beginning, would you like to tell us about where people can find you now? Tell us about the, uh, the Universal Consciousness Show, uh, Broadcast okay. Team Alpha. What are you up to and where can we find you now? Well, I, uh, right now I do, uh, with co-hosts, I do um, uh, the uh, Broadcast Team Alpha. I do with Nori Love. We are on uh, Tuesdays at uh, 8 o'clock in the evening East Coast, 5 o'clock in the evening West Coast time on kcorradio.com. And I also do the Universal Consciousness Show with uh, Diana Serafim. She is in Germany, and we do that on Mondays at 11 o'clock West Coast time. And we got one, the Universal, I mean, the Broadcast Team Alpha also on Wednesdays at uh, 2 o'clock, I mean, no, no, that's uh, 5 o'clock West Coast time and 8 o'clock uh, East Coast time in the evening. And uh, besides that, uh, go to uh, the YouTube channel with the same name and uh, you'll find us out there. All you have to do is to Google my name and you got about three weeks worth of reading. So that's... Oh, that's yes. Oh, yes. I spent a lot of time on your website looking through those pictures, over 5,000 amazing a mind opening pictures yeah and um yeah i just i just love the work that you do augie before we go though is there anything else you'd like to say yeah. to people uh, you mentioned the website uh that is www.universal-consciousness-show.com and in there, yeah, there is about 5,300 pictures of unbelievable things, including people walking on the moon to uh, all the stuff that you're not supposed to know about. If you go on another website, this is good. Um, we were talking about time travel here. Another one is, um, that's uh, www.agi-nust.com. You go into the picture gallery. Go to page eight. The seventh row of pictures down, I have photographic evidence of time travel. Something that I did. So you could uh, have a look at that and that'll bend your mind a little bit too. Good, good. Now, one other thing I just want to ask you too before we go is a lot of people are what they call awakening or awoke. They're starting to realize that there's a lot more to life than what they ever imagined. And the initial response, at least for me, when I was waking up was fear. What do you have to say to people about um, waking up to find out that the systems that are in place that we're, we're brainwashed into believing they're there for our own good, and then we start finding out they're not, we start finding about all the other ways of doing things. 
do you have a bit of advice for people that would help them to feel more secure, calm, or happier about their process? Mm -hmm. What I would say to young people, never grow up. It's a trap. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, and that's true, actually. Mm -hmm. You start thinking old, we're going to be old. Mm-hmm. And uh, I guess I'll never be old because I, I don't know how to do that. It's, uh, mm -hmm. I still have my, uh, my good and bad jokes in my head. And I, uh, yeah, I think young all the time. And I surround myself with people that is younger than me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, me too. I find people around 35 or even younger, we can just get into these amazing connections and conversations. Mm -hmm. And but people uh, my own age being in my mid 60s is, um, oh, I, I don't know. They're just I, it's harder to make the connection for sure. Yeah. But yeah, not that's, everyone. That's the tricky and dangerous part. Actually, confirming an age like that, that is a tricky part. We should say, well, I'm 35 because that's where my mind is right now. If yeah. Somebody, if uh, somebody asked me how old I am, I says, I really don't know. I was too young at the time when I was born. <laughs> I just have to take my mom's word for it. You know? yeah, yeah. But uh, I would, I'm going to ask the listeners a question. <clears throat> because knowing we live in a mind-created universe, mm -hmm. we uh, also know that that mind can then create everything around us. So I'm going to ask them a question. What would you start tomorrow morning if you knew you could not fail? Fantastic. Wait, wait 24 hours before you answer that question. Mm -hmm. I guarantee you nobody knows how to think big enough. <laughs> Yeah, you've been a, a, a bad, no, actually a good influence on me that way, where you brought that up to me before about not thinking big enough. Yeah. And, uh, but yeah, I think sometimes we're afraid of disappointment, but if we don't try, how will we ever know? That's right. And, you know? Well, Augie, it's really been a pleasure to have you on the show. Thank you so much for, for, for coming on and for sharing your, your wonderful knowledge. Um, and your wonderful book and uh, everybody please do get on there to uh, amazon.com and pick up your copy and get reading it today and um, I'll let everybody know when we can have Augie back for for another chat and of course the title is spiritual science higher conscious thinking and how to access the universal consciousness that's right thank you for reminding me okay Augie take care all right, you too. See you later.